Zoom guests. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are very happy to have you all here today. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the second episode of Sustainability Seminar Series. And this initiative is organized by the Students for Sustainability at Gaust, also known as S Square. The topic for today's lecture is the COVID-19 world and us. And I am delighted to introduce our speaker for today. And we are so grateful for having him, Professor Tadeusz Patsek. Ted Patsek is a professor of petroleum and chemical engineering and director of the Ali Al Naimi Petroleum Engineering Center at KAUST. Prior to joining KAUST, he served as a professor and chairman of the Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas, Austin. Between 1990 and 2000 and 2008, Patsek was a professor of geoengineering at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Ted Patsek is currently involved in sustainability and environmental research. Here at KAUST, he is teaching a very amazing course uh, energy and environment, previously known as uh, Earth Sources and Sustainability. And this course is uh, very interesting and one of the few courses offered at our university on sustainability topic. And if you're interested in this theme, uh, we strongly encourage you to take this course or audit this. Since 2003, uh, Patsik uh, has engaged in the studies of sustainability and industrial agricultural and agrofuel systems all viewed through the lens of ecology and irreversible thermodynamics. In fact, uh, his papers uh, in this domain are among his most cited and most important ones. For example, his work on the sustainability and thermodynamics of biofuel production in the US from crops. And in 2008, Patsek participated in the OECD uh, ministerial meeting in Paris uh, that coped uh, with the new biofuel mandates established in the US. In 2006 and 2007, Patsek and his son Lukas argued in vain against the irreversible damage of the tropical ecosystems in Indonesia, Malaysia, Equatorial Africa and Brazil. Professor Patsek has a blog about the, term, about the environment ecology, energy complexity, and human activities, with about half a million unique readers around the world. We are very happy and excited to have Professor Ted today with us, and the floor is yours, Professor. Okay. Well, thank you, Natalia, uh, and thank you, everyone, for showing up at this late time of the day. Uh, I would like also to thank Aman Alhaji, who's uh, out there, as well, these two young women actually have organized um, this student group, which is actually doing very well and is attracting quite a lot of attention among students and staff. Um, if I may appeal to, for everybody to uh, mute uh, their mics and turn off their vision so that we uh, save on uh, bandwidth, and I'll share my screen then if I may. And now I need to, to find my file among all these files that I have. And I did, and that's control L. And I'll minimize the icons, and now I'm ready to go. Okay, so um, thanks for showing up. Uh, this is the little virus that could. Um, the beast has uh, the size of one over 1,000 of a human hair width, and it really is defeating our global civilization like probably nothing else. So think of the um, scales that are involved here the whole earth and something that is measured in nanometers. Um, this, uh, the, the S square society and this talk actually uh, has evolved from the class I 
uh, taught at Berkeley, UT Austin, and now at KAUST. Uh, and the, the short title of the class is E to the Fourth, it's Earth, Environment, Energy, and Economics. Economics is in very small letters. Um, it's basically dealing with how the, work, uh, the, the Earth works and how the major ecosystems work and how do we interact with the planet. So the students who took the class will find many of the themes of the talk uh, quite familiar. Others, hopefully, will enjoy the talk too. Um, it's, it's a complicated talk, so you know I'll try to touch upon several themes. Um, the first one will be what I call a requiem for the global economy, which is being now undone uh, like never before and which most likely will never come back to its previous shape. Um, I'll show you a few symptoms of the current global slowdown and how we measure them. And they're both good and bad. Um, I will touch upon uh, the rich versus the poor countries and how different life and coping with the coronavirus pandemic it is. Then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and my own a statistical model of it, which seems to be doing actually splendidly well because it's so simple. Um, I will then go to uh, testing for and especially after the virus because this is the condition sine qua non of restarting the global economy. So I'll tell you a little bit about the pitfalls uh, with that uh, notion. And of course, I'll finish with where are we going to go from here and now. So here's a, a, a picture of, of the global economy. It is a complex web of tens of billions of interconnections among people, nations, companies, uh, everything, the environment. And so these billions of links and nodes uh, that represent the global economy uh, result in emergent properties of the network. So for example, uh, there is a percolation cluster in that network, and that's called the global economy. Um, uh, on this particular plot, you have some of the major interconnections for some of the major products. They are colored by the social inequity uh, uh, in the countries where these products are produced or manufactured. Red is bad, uh, blue is good, blue means rule of uh, the law, uh, well-organized institution, healthcare, and what have you. And you can see that, for example, crude oil is not produced in countries which boast best social structures, uh, by and large. So neither is footwear, uh, or copper, or raw cotton. But when it comes to cars, chemical products, microcircuits, um, they are produced in a countries which actually have what we call a much higher uh, human development index. Um, so again, this is a very, very complex web uh, and the percolating cluster now is being disassembled and becomes a set of disconnected cluster, uh, clusters. And it's a very different calculus of the properties of disconnected clusters. Um, we do not understand uh, the emergent properties of the global economy. Uh, each one of us has a few uh, ties, links, to other people, to Tamimi, uh, to people we know outside of Kaust, to Jetta, what have you. We understand these links, but we do not understand the links that are uh, actually implied by any product we purchase at Tamimi uh, and that supply line may extend around the world. So when a big convulsive event happens, uh, the implications tend to take years to play out and they usually spiral in unpredictable directions. For example, the stock market crash in 1929 in the United States, plus some nefarious actions of the British government and American banks, resulted in Hitler winning in Germany with great funding from these two countries. Uh, and of course, Hitler, uh, well, and others like him, uh, had undone the world as people knew uh, in 1933 and 39. 
uh, and there are many other examples. So in the years ahead, years ahead, we will learn what happens when that global web is torn apart and when millions or billions of those links are destroyed all at once, all at once. What happens then, we don't know, but the emergent new world economy will likely be rather different from the one that has prevailed over the recent decades. Uh, my contention is that the current global economy is dead. I also uh, submit to you that it would be completely foolish amid such uncertainty to make confident predictions about the future, whether it's five days, five months, or five years from today. And so uh, all the academic planning uh, for years or decades to come is a high risk proposition today, for example. Um, since uh, I'm not a usual petroleum engineer, I have a very small, uh, strong background in ecology and biology and, and such things. Um, I will draw actually on analogies between the economy and nature. And here is a plot that, you know, actually I produced in one of my papers 12 years ago, um, which essentially shows how ecosystems organize themselves between resilience and efficiency so that they gain optimum sustainability. So resilience is when we have diversity and redundant interconnections, so many species in an ecosystem and they support each other's functions, um, or local production and uh, highly variable, uh, diverse production in uh, countries. Uh, Germany is a good example of achieving that goal. And on the other hand, uh, extreme, you have efficiency, highly streamlined uh, ecosystems such as maize uh, or corn, soybean, um, uh, palm oil, and they're very efficient. Uh, they produce quite a lot at the cost of field chemicals and what have you. They're also incredibly fragile and they have to be protected at all times because they may go bust at any time due to a virus, fungus, and what have you. And that efficiency actually is the picture of the global economy. It is very efficient, extremely fragile, and absolutely unsustainable. Um, so keep that in mind when, we, when I proceed. Uh, another uh, uh, picture, uh, actually from the same paper, but it belongs to uh, two famous ecologists, Odom and Holling, uh, is the model of the cyclical ecosystem dynamics. And of course, again, uh, the analogy to the human economy is striking. So on the x-axis, you have connectedness or free energy accumulation. And for us, it would be, for example, free energy consumption, so uh, fuel consumption. On the y-axis, you have nutrient availability or a net uh, free energy influx to the ecosystem. And uh, the, the human analogy of that would be availability of resources and GDP per capita. Um, and you can see that um, these ecosystems all go through a loop. Uh, sometimes that loop takes three, four hundred years to complete. Sometimes it takes a year or two. The first one is early colonization. So weeds, bushes uh, that actually colonize barren land or early expansion of a human society, such as the colonization of the West in the US. Then there is an intense period of exponential growth, which is exploitation. And that would be uh, the period between, let's say, 1830 and 1960 in the US, intense exploitation of resources and growth of the economy. Then we have the climax and conservation at the top. Well, the, the ecosystem or the economy becomes mature and it's slowing down. Uh, and EU is actually a very good example of that. And then you have a catastrophe of, uh, for ecosystems, it's a fire. For us today, it's the coronavirus, which resets the system. And then the system restarts, but never exactly along the same path. Um, so again, keep that in mind that we are actually not so dissimilar to natural systems. So here are the good and bad effects of the slowdown. Uh, what you see here, and most of you probably cannot appreciate, 
is Los Angeles, downtown of Los Angeles, in absolutely clear air with the mountains behind, showing behind. That view is a rarity because of the remnants of smog from millions and millions of cars driving everywhere, uh, it, you know, at all times in LA. So that's a good thing. And in fact, air pollution around the world has decreased absolutely considerably and it's measurable by satellites uh, everywhere in the world. Um, but there are uh, not so good sides for the uh, human economy. So this is a, a snapshot uh, of the US economy uh, from January 21 to let's say uh, April 1, uh, where bad things really started happening, happening in the US. And you can see the changes of major indices of performance of the economy. So in green, you have groceries. People were stocking up, and I bet you are also stocking up at cost, your refrigerators are full. Uh, and then people discover that they cannot eat everything they have in the, in the refrigerator. Uh, uh, and then the, the purchases drop down, which is what's happening right now. Every other activity of the society actually went down considerably. So uh, taking care of your health in clubs and, and, and beauty down, entertainment and restaurants way, way down, uh, you know, around 30%. Trans public transportation down around 40%, um, shopping in general down about 60%, and travel um, down about 75%. And of course, that was April 1. Uh, today is April 21. And I think uh, all of these indices went down much further. Um, so this is pretty bad for the economy. Now, uh, because I am also a petroleum engineer, actually that is my main function at COUST, uh, uh, I have to watch out really carefully uh, what's happening to the oil markets. Uh, and of course the main use, user of uh, our products is our cars uh, and trucks. And driving is way, way down. For example, in Italy, uh, the, those little spikes are uh, weekly spikes of driving between one Sunday and another Sunday. Seems like on Wednesday everybody's driving the most. Um, so uh, Italy, in fact, uh, noted uh, driving uh, decline of almost 80%. United Kingdom, 61%. US, 40 Germany, 40 essentially the same. And all of these indices did not go up. In fact, they went down. Now they're slowly going up. So when your demand for the fuel declines by 40 to 80 percent, of course, bad things happen to the price of oil. Um, another indicator, which is actually uh, an excellent measure of the decline of economic activity, is electricity use, because so many things in, uh, are electrical uh, these days, including the network on which we all are and my computer into which I am talking. Um, so you can see that um, from the February average until April 5, uh, the US declined by about 7, 8%, Europe about 13%, and Italy uh, uh, around 23%. And of course, you can see that all of these ending segments of the lines are pointing steeply down. That decline continued uh, until today. Uh, so in general, uh, the electricity and economic activity um, is down probably by 40%, as uh, industry also is using a lot of heat, not just electricity. Um, in the cities which were hit uh, much harder than average, such as New York, uh, you can see, again, these are weekly cycles of use of electricity. Uh, you can see that in general, uh, the envelope, the Sundays declined by about 15% by April 6. Um, so that's a very, very significant decline of electricity use and therefore economic activity. Now, if you, if you live in, in a rich country like the US or Saudi Arabia and you are affluent, uh, your life is not entirely unpleasant. Um, 
that's actually a view from my house, uh, zoomed. So the house you see, I don't know if you can see the rainbow, but maybe you do. That's the hope that is coming up. Um, but the house on the horizon is at least a kilometer uh, from where I sit. Um, and so, uh, and in fact, I am sitting in front of that window. Right now it's still dark and I'm not sure that you see it. But you can see that life in a rich country, if you well off, is rather comfortable. So we're not suffering uh, at all. But many people in the US and elsewhere are suffering horribly, horribly. And that needs to be emphasized. And so I'll give you an example of uh, uh, Guayaquil in Ecuador, which is a city of 3 million people and a business capital of Ecuador. Ecuador is actually doing a decent job of counting and trying to prevent coronavirus, as opposed to many, many other um, poor countries which don't do such a good job. So uh, the, the, the official count uh, of deaths uh, was 388 on April 15 and 507 yesterday. Of course, the real count, death count is much, much higher. And, and one of the uh, persons, well, actually a, a, a person by the name of Moncada, basically said that what you see in Guayaquil, you see what happens in most of the South America's large cities, where you have pockets of cosmopolitan richness, just like the West, that coexist with widespread poverty and lack of resources. And it turns out that since late March, uh, government this, uh, recovered about 1,400 bodies from the Guayaquil homes at a rate of about 60 a day. So people were dying massively at home. So uh, poorer people have no options. They have to go out and they have to go to a marketplace. They have to mix there and they are exposed to all kinds of uh, environmental factors. The rich people are not. And that's because they have too little money, few or no refrigerators, and they live in very cramped conditions. So that's an incredible risk factor uh, for the billions of poor people uh, around the world. Um, and of course, uh, the medical system is completely overwhelmed. So the bodies keep on piling on the streets of uh, cities, poorer cities all around the world. And that's just one example in in Guayaquil. So let's switch gears and talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. And the, the picture you see here actually comes from a little hospital in Israel where uh, relatives were allowed to visit the die, dying elderly patients, essentially parents and grandparents. Um, so let's talk about the COVID-19 statistics. Um, there are somewhat uh, real uh, statistical inputs that come from the developed countries that are also democracies. Uh, and I stress that that are also democracies is a very important factor because they do not control information like almost every other country around the world. So, out of the 195 countries uh, in the world, uh, I'm being generous here. Perhaps 30 report uh, their COVID-19 deaths more or less accurately to the extent they can, albeit always undercounted uh, for reasons I will comment on uh, soon. All other countries either lie outright, hide, or don't know. And the category of don't know is the prevailing category around the world. Uh, the lying countries are few, but they're very important in terms of their population. <clears throat> but even in the developed countries, it is extremely difficult to establish who died from what cause or with what cause. So the official death count is from, that is in a hospital with a confirmed coronavirus. But as you know, most people don't die in the hospital, they die in nursing homes, at homes, or they also die from other things, uh, but they couldn't get help because the medical system is overrun with the coronavirus. 
So there is, a, a, again, a complex web of interconnections. And so if you count all these other deaths, which are always under counting, uh, my estimate, not only mine, the economists, other people uh, are talking about it, uh, that's leading to the official statistics that may be between a factor of two uh, or, or more uh, too low. So keep this in mind. And here is, uh, are actually two good statistical examples of how deaths are undercounted, uh, not because of ill will, but because of the inability uh, of the government to actually uh, know what's happening. So one is Northern Italy, city of Nembra. And what you can see here is an analysis done uh, by the economist between February 21st and March 31st, so a month. The black line is the average number of deaths in the city of Nembro. The uh, faint uh, pink uh, is the actual number of deaths occurring uh, in late February. And the bright red are the deaths accounted for as the coronavirus. And you can see that the incremental deaths are twice or triple uh, deaths that are actually officially counted. Here is another acute uh, center of epidemic, uh, the region of uh, Madrid, which is uh, and Castile La Mancha. Uh, and again, you can see the average number of deaths, which is the black line. Um, the, the pink is the incremental and the red is the official coronavirus. So again, the discrepancy is a factor of two or more. Um, and you can continue this analysis for um, uh, many cities and people will, in fact, give us another year or two and the scientists will actually will find out what was the actual death count from the coronavirus. But right now, over this month of March, uh, we can see that in the cities of uh, Bergamo in Italy, Castile and Leon in Spain, uh, Castile-La Mancha, haut rhin in France and Madrid, Spain. Uh, if you look at the background gray number of deaths, the corona deaths and all deaths, you will see that the coronavirus deaths undercount the actual uh, death count by a factor of two or three. So that's your 300%. And it happens everywhere. Um, now, uh, this is a little bit more technical. In fact, I will skip the most technical uh, uh, elements. Uh, we can talk about it offline later on. Um, so the coronavirus is spreading through clusters of infected people. And each cluster has its own probability distribution of death rates, which is the number of coronavirus deaths per day. And that, by the way, is the only solid example of statistics. The rest of it, the number of cases, the number of recovered, that's all so uncertain that I wouldn't even try to deal with, with those statistics. Um, and of course, that distribution uh, depends on the clusters, age distribution, the number of healthy people, wealth of the people, how they can isolate themselves, availability of hospital care, uh, pre-existing uh, medical conditions, and many, many other factors, which we don't know. And the cluster's probability distribution has a finite variance and a well-defined mean or expected value. That's by the physics. Nothing is infinite in this world, except for human economy. Um, and then there are many tens of millions of such clusters around the world, which are either completely uncorrelated or sparsely and weakly correlated. And then there is <clears throat> there are some more technical points which I will uh, uh, not mention, such as the daily summing up of random, independent, uh, discrete variables. But in the end, you expect um, what, what you count to be distributed along a Gaussian or the bell curve for the world or any other country. And, and here's the result. Um, this is a model I formulated a month ago now, and I adjusted it slightly. I started again from this very curve, I went up to 10,000 deaths, then I went down. So in the end, you see what I formulated uh, over a month ago and I didn't change it. 
the black line is the actual data, and you can see how uh, there's a huge variability in the death count. That's because of the medical systems unraveling and people counting or not counting. Um, the spikes are, for example, <clears throat> sudden counting of deaths in nursing homes uh, in New York and, and other places in the US. So we, we are dealing with significant undercounting of deaths. I was kind of, you know, trying to do the envelope, which is the magenta curve. And when you sum them up, you actually get um, uh, the green curve, which is the expected number of deaths around the world, official, which I counted around 300,000. The data are, are somewhat below. Um, if, you, if you do less undercounting, you're going to be like right on that curve. In fact, the deviation between the data and the curve is showing you the difficulties in data collection. That's my claim. Uh, but anyway, we are past the peak, according to this model. And I have not changed the model really uh, in the last three weeks. Uh, I have not adjusted any parameters. There are only two. Um, here is the US. The US is a very interesting case. Um, I started actually from around 4,000 deaths per day. Then I went down to a little bit less than three. Um, the data seemed to have followed the Gaussian very well. Um, then there was a big deviation and stop. Then you see the, the incredible spike uh, going to over 6,000 deaths per day. That's actually New York and, and New Jersey accounting for the deaths they didn't count. And now it's going down and we are on the other side of the peak. According to my calculation, the peak actually occurred four days ago. So we're going down. If you integrate this uh, with, again, I haven't changed anything uh, in three weeks because I formulated this model a bit later than the one for the world. Um, and, and you see the data and the model agree very well. We are past the peak. Um, and again, this model is, is done uh, by scrubbing uh, a Worldometer's web page daily and essentially downloading the data automatically and updating the curves. Um, so let's, um, let's move on to testing for the virus and for the antibodies that the virus created uh, in our bodies once we have recovered. And the key here is that the testing must radically ramp up in every country uh, that, can, that is wishing to restart to one degree or another. So the testing for the virus um, is occurring uh, mostly through the reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction or RT-PCR and, and uh, that um, machine uh, targets a gene that codes for the proteins that uh, makes the virus's shell um, uh, nucleocapist which an envelope which contains all of its RNA. So we, we want to extract the virus's RNA, then we create a piece of complementary DNA, and then we multiply that piece by thousands or hundreds of thousands of times, uh, and then we analyze the results and we see if there was the virus's RNA or not in the patients, so if the patient is sick, infected or not. This is a complex process. All machines are proprietary. All the chains that lead to the machine are proprietary, including the swabs, the vials you can see, the chemicals that protect the sampled material from deterioration in the vials, the chemicals which are used by the machine, the machine itself, and the analysis itself. So there's a few companies around the world, uh, La Roche, um, uh, uh, Thermo Fisher uh, uh, Analytical, uh, Abbott Laboratories, uh, that produce most of these uh, chains that lead to the analysis. Uh, and if you happen to have bought a, a Roche machine, you cannot use anything by Abbott uh, and vice versa. And these companies have a very difficult time keeping up uh, with the supply chains and scaling up 
uh, to uh, the necessary levels. Right now, the vials, swabs, and chemicals in the vials are the missing link. And that's why in the US, the states cannot actually ramp up because they don't have enough uh, supplementary materials. Now, there is a, a several uh, startups, young companies in California, uh, and that's Cefaid, Meza Biotech, and of course, there's also Abbott Laboratories, which are promising to shorten the test from a day or more, several hours to, to a few days, to 15 minutes for the Abbott Laboratories. So that's a huge um, a progress in a very short time, um, and hopefully this testing will be done. But then, after you're done, we want to test for the antibodies in your blood uh, that uh, actually define your resistance to further infection. So, right now in the US, we have 45 tests per 100,000 people. That's on April 15. And in order for us to get restarted, we need at least 150 tests per 100,000 people um, as a seven day average. And we're not there. And in fact, we cannot get there despite the false promises of the federal government because simply the supplies aren't there. Um, so uh, let's, uh, so when we are ramped up and when we do massive testing, we will receive certificates of immunity from the COVID-19 and this will allow us to operate normally uh, in, the, um, in the society. And of course, uh, these tests are monitored by the US NIH and FDA, National Institutes of Health and Food and Drug Administration, and they're coming online. And so I'll talk about one of these tests uh, uh, and what happens when you have a positive antibody test. Um, and people need to understand the statistics of it to save lives. So this is very important, pay attention. So for example, a company by the name of Salex makes an FDA approved antibody test. And the goal is to test for immunity due to prior exposure rather than active infection. So you are now recovered, you've been exposed to the virus. Okay? So Salex's um, sensitivity uh, is about 94% and specificity is about 96%. And the sensitivity means the probability a person tests positive when they are infected and the specificity is the probability that a person tests negative given that they are uninfected, not infected. And that, and that those numbers, 93.8 and 95.6%, simply mean that 6.2% percent of people who are positive test negative and that only 4.4 percent of people who are negative test positive so false positives what does it mean then when you test positive and here actually our sciences are at a distinct advantage because we all are used to bayesian statistics bayesian learning and conditional probabilities and but th this graphic was developed actually this is your peer reviewed on twitter by a whole bunch of people who are looking at the results and that's a beautiful graphic uh, that illustrates uh, the risks so let's suppose that i pick a random sample of one million people and the incidence or the rate of infection is one percent which is actually typical of most populations today uh, and i use the sensitivity and, and selectivity uh, of, of, of this test as advertised. So there is 990,000 uninfected people in that sample. And uh, given the sensitivity, I'm gonna get about 44,000 of false positives. Then there is 1% on, or 10,000 of people who are infected. I will detect 9,380 uh, of these people that they are actually were infected, and then 620 will go undetected. So let's calculate the ratio of the false positives to real and, and express them as a percent, which means in that particular case, 82%, 82% of positive tests are false. 
which means that your sense of security, uh, given a positive test, is in fact false. So we have to be very careful. So here's the take home message. Um, the high sensitivity, so the probability that you test positive when you are positive, that's 94%, does not mean that the conditional probability that you are positive when you test positive is high. That in fact, 82 out of 100 people in this example who get a positive test will be still susceptible to the virus. And only 10% of the population, once 10% uh, of the population is infected, this drops to 30% or 3,100 people, but that's a lot of people. So we have to be careful. So if you get a positive antibody test and you think that you're immune and, and quit socially distancing, uh, you are far more likely than not to make a big mistake. And when millions of people question. make the same mistake, then we have a problem because many people uh, may die in addition. And this is recorded, you can actually download the calculator or you can use the online calculator of these conditional probabilities and make your own calculations. So where and when from here? And, and usually this quote, the harrier I go, the behind there I get, that's attributed to Lewis Carroll, my beloved author, it is not. And it doesn't belong to the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. So I have to set the record straight here because I care so much about Lewis Carroll. But anyway, we are a, a, a civilization in a hurry and we want to get out of everything running. And I just told you is that we need to take it one step at a time because the risk of making serious mistakes is incredibly, incredibly high. So let's talk now about uh, oil consumption. And, and I talk about it uh, not to irk the good environmental people among us here, um, but because there is a tight one-to-one -one correlation between GDP of each country and the world and oil consumption. In fact, uh, there probably are very few things which are better correlated. So we can see how uh, the annual growth uh, has been going on from the first quarter of 2007 uh, up until uh, the second quarter of 2020 and the prediction to the end of 2020. And you can see that the financial collapse of 2008 resulted in decline of consumption by about 3%. And today we are declining in consumption by about 18% or more. Uh, and we are predicting for the year to have a decline of consumption of 16%. Uh, uh, if you ask me, when did it happen the last time? My answer is never. That event has never occurred before. We are in a new uncharted territory, both for the industry and the world. And here is a, a, a screenshot um, somebody took and, and I, uh, Sergei, a scientist in my group also took another screenshot, which was actually gentler than this one. So there were many contracts for crude uh, that were settling uh, at negative prices. This is West Texas Intermediate, uh, a benchmark crude for America. And that particular contract, which was due in May, settled just at minus 37, $38 per barrel, down about 306%. What it means, it means that the tanks are full, the tankers are full, the pipelines are full, nobody's buying. You made a commitment to buy crude oil, that crude has nowhere to go. So therefore, if you are a seller, you have to pay the buyer to take, your, to take the crude from you. Uh, of course, that cannot last. Um, so, so what to do next? Uh, I, I am... Uh, a member of two large group of scientists, you know, writers, economists, financiers, and so on. Um, and we talk about this, I would say, 50 times a day, every day. Uh, and we exchange emails and talk directly. So out of that, um, my friend, a, a petroleum geologist uh, from Houston, Art Berman, uh, has come up with this table, and I'll just quote it because uh, that's a very good table. 
So we have four quadrants here of what to do next. And there's high necessity, low necessity, low risk, and high risk. So let's start from the upper uh, left corner. So high necessity and low risk is working from home, uh, manufacturing and construction, uh, pharmacies, big box and hardware stores, they all need to function, auto repair shops. Uh, in most countries, not in Saudi Arabia, it's actually liquor stores. Uh, the liquor consumption has gone up uh, several fold. And of course, you absolutely have to keep banks open because otherwise panic develops. When we go to the high risk and high necessity, uh, that's going to, your, to do your groceries and mix with people, uh, which we all do to one degree or another. Hospitals and medical care is an absolutely high necessity, very high risk proposition. So don't do any medical procedures unless you really have to. Daycare centers are breeders of the virus, so are schools. Um, Food supply and distribution uh, is actually also a breeder of coronavirus. So in the US, as a perfect example of a highly optimized, absolutely fragile supply systems, we have two meat processing plants in South Dakota and Colorado, which process around 80% uh, around of all meat in the United States. In South Dakota, there were 200 coronavirus cases among the workers, the plant shut down, so did the one in Colorado. So you defeat the entire supply systems by having it so efficient. And of course, the goods distribution, the Amazon's UPSs, uh, with all the people who work there, are absolutely necessary, but they uh, have a risk of gaining coronavirus. Low necessity, all the things I won't even mention, such as the one we're doing right now, uh, we don't have to do it, we do it, but that's fine. Um, and then low necessity and high risk, there would be tourism, air travel, uh, cruises. Well, cruises are no more, not for a while. Uh, having a drink at a restaurant or a dinner, movies, theaters, uh, going to a soccer game, uh, to a shopping mall, uh, to a gym or swimming pool, uh, to a salon and spa and to a museum. So all of these activities will essentially either cease or be greatly diminished uh, for the months or even uh, years to come. And uh, finally, just to finish, to wrap up and leave some time for uh, questions, uh, here's a view from Anberg, the Petroleum Center, and the oil patch. Um, the old global and many local economies are expiring as we are speaking, and in fact, we don't know in most cases how bad this is. Uh, it really will become apparent by the end of May and in June. So May, June, July are the crucial months to see, to uncover how bad things actually are. Uh, reopening is a partial solution uh, with unknown and unintended outcomes, as I just outlined with the massive testing. All markets will adjust and prices will increase slowly, very slowly, once there is a clear path uh, out of uh, this economic closure and some employment. Uh, there's an interesting point. We try to manage oil markets and this effort has failed miserably, so miserably that the entire countries are in fact now in trouble and one of these countries is Saudi Arabia. Um, the world in depression will need more oil than ever. That is, to restart, we're going to start using oil everywhere. And unfortunately, uh, and sometimes to great detriment of humanity, oops, I misspelled this one, um, I, we will pay less attention uh, to environment, renewable energy, and climate change. So there will be bad things happening in these areas. Um, uh, in my mind and my, in the mind of many people I talk about, especially the finance people, the greatest near-term risk for the, global, for the globe, for the earth, for the global economy, is the crash of the financial system from the cascading defaults and collapse of the developing world. And that cascading crash could be followed by the developed countries. Now, let me just see how am I doing for time. 
uh, I still have 11 minutes, so let me just address the students directly, uh, because you are the ones with the greatest uh, stake in all of this, and and you, uh, you know, uh, you still have many years ahead of you uh, in a world we don't know too much about. Um, so first of all, you're young, you're healthy, and even if you get coronavirus, uh, you're gonna go through it and maybe not even know that you did. Uh, unfortunately, while doing so, you may infect your parents and grandparents and your professors, just like me, who will actually suffer greatly and may die. Uh, so there will be an, a generational turnover uh, for one reason or another uh, because of this fact until we get a very good vaccine, which is probably a, a year and a half or two years away, unless some really miraculous things will happen. Um, the second uh, uh, point I would like to make to you and those of you who took, you know, RP200, E to the fourth class, you know that, uh, that we have to be very cognizant of how the human economy is organized and how does it pe perform uh, relative to the natural world. And of course, to most others, that, that uh, notion is not very familiar, uh, but one of the things that comes out very clearly from a class like this, is that you need to have professions which are useful. And especially in hard times like these, hard professions which will deliver value to the society, not be esoteric something that I might publish 10 years from now, uh, will be valued. Um, the uh, professions that do not render immediate value to the society will not be valued and you will not find employment. Now, employment will be, in general, a very difficult thing to find. So, uh, in this new economy, I hope there will be many young startups companies led by the young people who will create a new web of links and create a new picture of the global economy. There is a, a downside to this. All of these startup companies need capital to get started and capital right now is frozen. So it is absolutely incumbent on the governments of this world to provide capital to the people, for the people, not capital to large corporations so they can buy back their stock and become even richer and more oppressive. And so uh, that is unfolding in different ways and in different styles in most countries. The US has a giant stimulus package uh, of three trillion dollars plus and growing, which is actually, I would say, 50% misplaced and is gonna do some real damage to the real economy before we find how to use this river, ocean of money better. With that, I am open for any questions you might ask and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ted, uh, for such uh, amazing talk. Uh, truly a lot of uh, food for thought in uh, each slide that you showed today. And um, now we have um, a little bit of time for questions. And uh, you all uh, can see them and uh, can send them in the Zoom group chat. And uh, Professor, you can see the questions as well, but I will read them loudly for... Um, Please do. Uh, for yes. people to hear and also for the recording purposes. Uh, okay, the first question is from uh, Abdullah. Thank you for the great talk, Professor Patsek. Is it early to say which government strategy to compact COVID-19 is better? Moderate economy closure uh, aiming for herd immunity or aggressive economy closure and supporting the most vulnerable businesses? Well, uh, <laughs> thank you for this very uh, difficult question. Um, so, it depends where you stand. I think the poorer countries have no choice but to keep their economies uh, partially open uh, at all times, simply because people cannot store food and cannot 
um, separate themselves for long periods of time. Uh, for the rich economies, as you know, there were different approaches. If you have a disciplined, well-educated society, which is trusting their government, and that would be Sweden, Holland, or Denmark, uh, you actually do not have to shut down the entire economy as, as they did not, uh, because people will be uh, reacting in an enlightened way, and in fact, uh, trying to avoid getting infected. Uh, of course, there is a price to pay in terms of deaths, but I think this experiment has worked. The intermediate experiment was done by Germany, which, that, uh, which did a very significant shutdown, but uh, has been now uh, uh, relenting on the shutdown in a very um, organized, well, nothing less would be expected from the Germans uh, way. But this was done because of the exquisite uh, healthcare system with the highest number of beds, uh, probably in the world, outside of very tiny countries, um, uh, and incredibly high level of testing. Uh, the intermediate example, or rather on the downside, is the US, in which the government, the federal government, uh, was completely confused and inactive until uh, early March, and then reacted poorly, uh, inconsistently, and uh, did not provide the resources to the states. Um, also, the trust in government in the US is, has been, is at all time low, which means that people simply don't listen to what the government tells them. Uh, now, when it comes to local governments, the states, uh, that trust is much higher. So what you're seeing in the US is a devolution from the federal rule governance to local governance where blocks of states are forming alliances and uh, we'll see what happens during the election of 2020, but we very well may be seeing a permanent, uh, uh, well, devolution of the United States into groups of states. Um, and then, so all, uh, all outcomes have been uh, tried or strategies. Some worked better, some didn't work so well. Um, uh, in poor countries, you have, very, you have very few options. You don't have hospitals, you don't have testing, uh, you don't know how many people are sick, but you do know that they live in close proximity. Uh, that's on the minus sign. On the plus side, you also know that they have higher resistance to sickness because they live in, in such unhealthy conditions. And so hopefully the, the rate of, of, of infection might be lower, but we don't know that. So if I were to sum up what I know, I would say the jury is still out. We don't know what's gonna happen over the next uh, three, four, five months until the end of this year. Uh, only let's say in December we will know which experiments work better and which didn't work so well. Right now, we don't know. Thank you, Professor Ted. Uh, next question uh, um, is from Bora. We have uh, uh, time for uh, very few questions left. Um, can you uh, elaborate the financial long-term projections uh, from your side? <laughs> so you're asking me to answer this in 30 seconds. <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, again, I don't know. It will depend if and how the global financial system freezes. Um, if there is a setback of the global economy, which is approaching 30%, right now it's projected to be between 16 and 20%, then the financial effects will be extremely serious. I'll stop here. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ted. I think we will take uh, the rest of questions uh, offline if uh, Professor Ted agrees on that. Um, because uh, we have uh, no time to discuss all of them. Well, uh, but uh, <laughs> we would like uh, to thank you uh, for uh, participation in our um, seminar series. Uh, and um, thank you uh, everyone for joining us. Um, 
I would like to also thank uh, all team of the Students for Sustainability for the organization and the support, and especially uh, Eman Al Haji, the president, and uh, also uh, the organizer of all this seminar series. And we would be very glad uh, to see you in our next uh, online events. Uh, all our updates are on Facebook. Uh, please uh, join our group. Uh, on Facebook uh, and uh, if you're interested uh, you also can join us as a volunteer or as a member. Thank well, you, thank very, you much. very much <laughs> and I'm signing off as well. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.